Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. And let's see what the Lord would have to say to us to challenge us to be more like him. More like him. Jeremiah 29. As always, I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard. Um, But of course, whatever translation you are reading in, you can follow along with me. Jeremiah 29. Now, when you get to Jeremiah 29, please let me know that by signifying it with a there. Amen. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Familiar passage of scripture, but I want to really speak this thing to your spirit today. For I know, this is the word of the Lord through the prophet. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare. Now, he's not talking about SNAP and Social Security. He's not talking about what the state considers welfare. He's talking about what is for your good. What is for your benefit. Can I help you? Which testament are we reading? The old. It wasn't the trick question, saints. (laughs) Everybody like, uh, uh, which testament is this? The The old. Which dispensation are they living in during the time of the prophet Jeremiah? The law. They're under the period of the law. Now, we have this idea that God is good in the New Testament. God was mean in the Old Testament. Right? God had a, a, a personality shift between the Old and the New. They say, well, why do we have 400 years of silence in between covenants? Because God was trying to figure out who he wanted to be. And then he thought, well, I'll just try that grace thing. And then we come to Matthew. That's how Christians perceive God. Like he had this big ship. God has always been concerned for your welfare. Old Testament, New Testament, law, grace. It has always been about what is good for these people that I love so much. And I think maybe God was talking to us today because we have this idea of him being so wrathful and so vengeful and so hateful. And God says, I'm not going to allow you to assign to me feelings I don't have. I know what I think about you. I know the thoughts I have of you. It's almost like he's actually combating someone who claimed his thoughts were other than they are. Because he starts off by saying, I know the thoughts, the plans that I have for you. And those plans are not to destroy you. Those plans are not to humiliate you. Those plans are to bring you peace. Plans for welfare, not for calamity. Plans to give you a future and a hope the King James I believe says to bring you to an expected end that word um, expected end in the Hebrew is tikva it is spelled for your notes T-I-Q V-A-H T-I-Q V-A-H tikva Tikva means, as we saw here, hope. It means expectancy. Expectancy. Something to long for or anticipate. (laughs) Hope, expectancy, something to long for, something to anticipate. What does that mean? That means God is saying to us, he wants, he has something planned for you that is worthy of anticipating. That's worth longing for. So how can we live our lives in defeat and fear and hurt and pain and frustration when God is thinking good thoughts about us? And he said, if you only knew the things I'm looking forward to doing in your life, 
If you only knew the place that this process is leading you to, I'm telling you, it's worth anticipating. Have you ever anticipated something and wound up disappointed? Like, boy, that wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Somebody's been married and said that wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Right? You, you finally started dating the person that you just had a crush on all your days. That wasn't all it was cracked up to be. <laughs> right? You know, I, I want this job. This is the one, baby. I, I would love to do this. God in that sucker. This wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Have you ever anticipated something and been disappointed? God is saying the end that I have for you is worthy of anticipating. It's worth hoping for. It's worth expecting, expectation, expectancy, all right? Very interesting about this word, tikva. Literally, it means a cord, C-O-R-D. What type of cord? A cord as in an attachment. Something that attaches, this is, this is like amazing, something that attaches one thing to another, tikva. A cord, a cable, something that attaches one thing to another. Think of a rope, okay? And you have two things that are yoked together through this by this rope, this cord, this tigva, okay? What is it saying? That your expectancy, your hope, is what's going to connect you to the thing that God wants to bring you to. All right. See, we think that all we need is the Lord to want it. God didn't say, I'm doing it. God said, this is what I hope for you. This is what I have planned for you. This is what I desire to do. But the thing that's going to connect you to what God's plan and purpose is for your life is your hope for it. Your expectation. All right. Where there is no hope. Or there is no expectation. There's this song that Damien and I like. I think we actually had it played after our ceremony, our wedding ceremony. And it said, expect the great. I even preached a message called expect the great like a year or two ago. Expect the great. Why? Because if you're not expecting the great, you won't see the great. You have, and it's, no matter what area of life it is, any area of life, health, Marriage, family, finance, career, whatever area of life it is, we have to. Paul made a statement. He says, stir up the gift that is in you. Well, I want to shift that and say, stir up the expectation. Expectation is not something that is going to automatically arise in us based solely on circumstance. Why? Because your circumstances are not always going to be consistent with what it is that you're expecting God to bring you to. You can't tell me that the valley of the shadow of death spoke to David's heart about the table prepared for him on the other side. One did not speak about the other. And then when he got to the other, it was easy to even forget about the process that got him there because of how wonderful the other place was. I got to the, to the table and I forgot all about the valley, valley because God, I thank you for what you had in store. It was hard going through, but now I'm grateful because it brought me to the place that you said was worth anticipating. All right. So uh, 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 learning to, by faith, stir up hope. For an expected end, an end that is worth anticipating, worthy of expecting. You bind or connect, you bind or connect yourself to God's plans for your life through your expectation. I think this is a good spot to give you the subject for this message which I'm almost done with, by the way. Hope for tomorrow. Hope for tomorrow. 
What man, Paul asks, hopes for what he already has? By its very nature, hope speaks to that which has not manifested yet. In other words, by its very nature, hope is speaking to tomorrow. It's not speaking to the present, but to the future, because you don't hope for what already is. That means hope is going to always need to exercise or involve faith in order to believe that that what you're hoping for is not vain. Paul calls it a hope that does not disappoint. Because I was talking about a hope that does. The experiences that we have in life where things aren't all that, they, that we expected them to be. So you can't just hope for anything and try to release faith in anything. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. If you are hoping on something that was of your own choosing, that hope can disappoint. That's what you call the crapshoot of life. Sometimes things work out the way you were hoping and sometimes they don't. But with God, all the promises of God are yea and amen. If you want to have a 100% success rate with zero disappointment, the only way to do that is to stand on the promises of God. Release hope. Release expectation, expectancy in what God said. In what God spoke to your heart about what's to come. I know the thoughts I have for you. The plans I have for you, the New American says. Plans for your welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and an end worth anticipating. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, or as I've heard it called by some, the book of Filipinos. That's not a joke, I actually have heard that. So honey, Jesus went and visited the people in the Philippines, praise the Lord. Philippians chapter 3, when you're there, say there, verse 13. Philippians 3, verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. Of what? The hope. The end that God has you know, prepared for me. I don't actually claim to have laid hold of it yet. But here's what I do. Forgetting those things which lie behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press Toward the goal, toward the mark for the prize of the upward or high call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I, sometimes I don't care for how they separate out these verses because they'll put two sentences in one verse, but yet break up one sentence in two verses. So now understand what he's saying. Brethren, I do not, and sister in I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it. He says, but one thing I do. Here's what he says. Here's what I do. I'm not there yet, but this is how I'm going to get there. I've got to say that again. He's, he's, he's laying out the secret of the process of getting where God has told him he was going. Here's how I get there. All right? Brethren, I do not regard, I count not myself to have apprehended, the King James says. All right? But here's what I do. Now, when he says forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, that is not a period at the end of that verse. That's not what he does. He says, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things, that's not what he's doing. What he's doing is verse 14. What he's doing is pressing toward the mark. Forgetting those things is how he's doing it. All right? So he says, let me read it a different way. Make this plain. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. 
But one thing I do, I press on toward the mark for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus by forgetting those things which are behind and reaching to those things which lie ahead. You cannot press toward the mark of what is ahead if you are still trapped in the prison of what's behind. They say the song, they sing the song, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. You better learn. Because you will not get to tomorrow if you are still living and wallowing in the disappointments of yesterday. I, I just, I feel the need to tell you again. I guess for the third time. One for the Father, one for the Son. This is for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, I press. I press. I don't walk. I press. That means there's opposition but I'm pressing. I don't see it but I'm pressing. There's frustration but I'm pressing. There's disappointment but I'm pressing. Things are not happening the way I expected them to happen but I'm pressing. See because God, told, God never told you what the process was going to be like. He just told you what the end was going to be like. And so because you are in a valley of the shadow of death you think that's all God had in store for you. But he's pressing forward through the valley. He's pressing for the mark, for the, toward the mark, for the prize of the high call of God in Christ by forgetting those things which are behind and reaching to those things which lie ahead. So this means something, saints. You need to get some, some level of revelation about what lies ahead. You, you, he, he's not asking you to just reach in the dark and grope around. He said, have a goal in mind. Have a, have a target. Have something that you're expecting God to do. You need to get a revelation. Get before God. God, listen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I think it's verse 11. We all know, you know, I have not seen, ear, have not heard, dot, 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 blah, blah, blah. And I always talk about that. But he has revealed them to us. That means you're supposed to know. You're supposed to know the things God has prepared for them that love him. You're supposed to know his purpose for your life. You're supposed to know what you're here to do. Even if it's not necessarily what's going to be, what you're going to be doing 40 years from now. Know what he has for you today. Know what he has for you tomorrow. So that you have something to press toward. Listen, saints, the world even knows this principle. Corporate America always asks their employees for goals. Put down some goal. We need some targets because you can't just, we're not just paying you for today. We're paying you for tomorrow. God is not just paying us for today, y'all. He has good things in store for us. But if we are not living and walking in expectancy, we're not connecting ourselves to that which lies ahead. Romans 4. Romans 4. You know, um, I really think that this has a lot to do, Romans 4, with what um, Paul was talking about in Ephesians 3 verse 20. Where he says, he makes that statement, uh, we know that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. But he continues on in that verse and he says, according to the power that worketh in us. He's able, but it's only going to be according to the power <laughs> that worketh in us. Now think about that. He's not just doing anything. It says it sets as a benchmark all that we ask or think. That's the benchmark. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. But the benchmark is what we ask or think. But he only does exceeding abundant. See, it's one thing for God to be able to. It's another thing for him to do. 
what, what, what enables him to actually do what he's capable of doing? The power that works within us. What is the power? It's not the ibajibas. It's not the quickening. It's the power of your expectancy. Are you expecting him to do what you asked? Are, he, are you expecting him to do what you think? Or are you just asking and thinking? See, we have plenty of petitions that we ask of God, but are we expecting him to do it? See, saints, if I get into in a really bad car accident and I could die, listen, I need y'all to not just pray for the sake of praying. And that's the mistake that we make in the church. We do a lot of things out of religion. It's our responsibility to pray because the pastor didn't got hit by a car. Listen, and you're praying and you're crying because you think I'm, I'm going to die. If you think I'm going to die, stop praying. Because he does according to what you ask or think. If what you're thinking is not consistent with what you're asking, the power that's working in you is working against you. Because the, the power of the mind is working against the power of the tongue. And then you're wondering why we're left to the natural devices. Because the spiritual power is fighting against itself. So therefore nature is just taking its course. If I live, I live. And if I die, I die. It's all in the hands of the doctors. Because the power of God is fighting against itself inside of me. Man. God's not fighting himself. I'm not saying God is fighting himself. What I'm saying is God has empowered your thought life. And he's also empowered your tongue. When both of them are empowering two opposing notions, they're canceling each other out. That's good, man. So we got to make sure that when we're praying for people, when we're believing God, honey, align your entire being to that which you are daring to ask God to do. And if you can't dare to ask him to do it, Hush until you can. Ask God to help your unbelief. Lord, I believe with my mouth, but help the unbelief of my mind. Lord, I believe in my mind, but help the unbelief of my mouth. Because I keep believing I'm going to be pros prosperous, but I keep saying I'm broke. So but help the unbelief of my mind. Sometimes it's one or the other. The mind is crazy or the mouth is crazy. Oh, yes. We have to align ourselves toward the mark. <laughs> oh man. Because our expectancy binds us to that. It binds us to tomorrow. To that which we are hoping and expecting God to do. All right, so Romans 4, verse 18, says this, talking about Abraham uh, believing God for a child even in his old age. In hope against hope. <laughs> okay, that's, that's just pause right there. If you are able in your Bible, you may want to like, don't underline the whole phrase in hope against hope because it might, you might miss it. Maybe highlight in two different colors or circle both of them individually, those two phrases, in hope, against hope. He said, because that makes no sense whatsoever. In hope, against hope. Now, what does that mean? That means this. In our practical thought patterns, there are things that are reasonable to hope for. And then there are things that are unreasonable. <laughs> what is the good to hope for? What is it unreasonable to hope for? That if I go to the top of the Empire State Building and jump off, 
I can hope that I fly. I can. But it's unreasonable to. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now watch this. If I go to the top of the Empire State Building and jump off in hope, I may be in hope, but it's against hope. It's, uh, it's against what's reasonable to hope for. So then what Paul is saying here about Abraham is that the thing that Abraham was hoping for was unreasonable to expect. It was unreasonable to hope for even though he still hoped for it. If the only thing that you can hope for is what's reasonable, you are limiting what God can do. Pastor, are you telling us to go jump off? No, I was using an analogy to make the point. Right, Jesus, I use a parable. Jesus talked about the rich man and Lazarus and people created doctrine around that. I said, baby, it was a parable. He was just trying to make a point. Don't turn it into a doctrine. There's nobody in hell called uh, the rich man, whatever his name was. And there's nobody in Abraham's bosom called Lazarus. It was a parable intended to make a point. Can I prove it? Hell is not on fire yet. But the rich man said, dip your finger in the water, come cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. Hell won't be put in the lake of fire until Revelation 21, I think. All right. So I'm saying, it, parables are parables. They're just intended to make a point. Now here, so, so I'm not telling you to jump off the Empire State Building. If you do, I'll perform a funeral. <laughs> but now, hoping against hope. To hope against hope is not to hope for anything that's unreasonable. It's to hope for what God said that's unreasonable. Because sometimes the thing that God plans to do in your life, it's not reasonable to hope for it. Supernatural and miraculous healings by their very nature contradict the laws of nature. That's why they're miracles and not just improvements. When God steps in and redirects the very course of nature, that's called a miracle. It's unreasonable, unreasonable to hope for a miracle. But if God is going to do it, hope against hope. If God spoke that he's our healer. Hope against hope. So this is where we find Abraham at in this verse. So let's read it again with that context. In hope, verse 18, in hope against what was reasonable to hope for, Abraham believed. Not just anything but what God had spoken. In order that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. And without becoming weak in faith, you only release faith when the word came. That's the right kind of faith. Faith comes by hearing that which has been spoken. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body. He realized that in the natural, there was no way for this to happen. He contemplated his own body now as good as dead. <laughs> it's gracious. Oh, wake up, y'all. He contemplated his own body that was as good as dead. Now, that's funny to me. Since he was about 100 years old, he contemplated also the, the deadness of Sarah's womb. And yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. He was mindful of how unreasonable it was to believe God. He knew how old he was. His, he knew that Sarah, she wasn't going through menopause. She had been through menopause. Menopause is over. All right? Her womb is not dying. It's dead. It's barren. Tumbleweed is blowing around inside the womb. 
yet with respect to the promise of God. When it came, yet when, let me, when, with, with respect, he's not talking about respect, honor, reverence. He means in regards to. But when it came to, but when it came to the promise of God, regardless of what he saw, regardless of how little sense it made, when it came to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but he grew strong in faith. How did he grow strong in faith? This is so powerful. He grew strong in faith, giving glory. Put up verse 20, please. He grew strong in faith. There you go. Giving glory to God. That's how. Say, well, okay. You're not going to get a word from maybe in the moment you got it. You got excited. Right. But see, after the excitement wears down, you begin considering your own body. <laughs> you begin considering the circumstances. Don't you all remember how Peter jumped out of that boat as soon as the Lord called him? Bid me to come. And he said, he said well, come on. If he's got dog and I got a word. He got out of that boat and began to walk, right? But it doesn't take long after the excitement wears down that he said, now wait a minute. <laughs> I'm out here on the water. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how much faith you have. You will always at some point contemplate your body. Contemplate the circumstances and how unreasonable it is to believe that what God said do, you're going to be able to do. Or that it's going to be able to happen what God promised was going to happen. Every human being. Don't beat yourself in the head. For contemplating your own body. The thing is, don't let the contemplation of your circumstance breed unbelief. I love how real this is because the old saints would have told you, don't contemplate the circumstances. Don't think about the circumstances. That sounds good behind the pulpit, but that's not real life. That's not. You can't help but recognize the circumstances that surround you. So rather than trying to give you some kind of unrealistic path, we, we, we have this example of Abraham who did in fact contemplate the unreasonableness of the promise. But yet when it came to the promise itself, he did not waver in unbelief. He did not have great and wonderful faith instantly, but he grew in faith. How did he grow in faith? Giving glory to God. Yes. So what does that mean? Here's where Peter missed it on that, on that water. Peter is walking on the water, and what happens is, when he begins to contemplate the circumstances, the wind's blowing, this is H2O under my feet and not glass, then he begins to sink. Why? Because he takes his eyes off of the Jesus that's ahead of him, off of the mark that he's pressing toward, and he puts it on his present circumstances. See, you can contemplate your circumstances without putting your eyes on your circumstances. The text said, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And in the exact same way, we have a responsibility to keep our eyes fixed. Yes, you are going to acknowledge and recognize your circumstances. Listen, faith is not the ignorance of your circumstance. I don't mean ignorance, but the ignorance. Faith is not ignoring the reality of your predicament. That's how people fall off the wagon. Because you were trying so long to ignore it, but now it just overwhelmed you and your faith couldn't survive. God is not telling you to ignore the reality. He's telling you to believe him through it. To trust him despite it. That's how your faith grows when you are able to praise God. Not because you won't acknowledge the, the problem. But you praise him through it. In spite of it. 
even in light of it. So we had this exercise at small group on Wednesday about getting that thing that we're trusting God for, we're believing God for, in our mind. And then we had a little worship moment. And the notion was not to worship him in spite of it, to ignore the whole situation, but to worship him in light of it. Worship him even in light of the thing that you are trusting him to do. And saying, God, I'm trusting you with this, so therefore I'm not allowing it to hold me back or to hold me down. I'm still going to glorify you in it. And in doing that, you are able to build and strengthen your faith. All right? Now, I just gave you a million dollars worth of revelation. That right there is a million dollars worth. Because it will change your life. It will change your life. Don't ignore it. Praise him through it. And trust him for it. Psalm 42. I want to end in this reading. Psalm 42. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. When you get to the 42nd Psalm, say there. Psalm 42. Hope, we're talking about. Hope for tomorrow. Hope to get us to the expected end, the end worthy of anticipating the, the hope, the, the tikvah, hope for, uh, it, it's going to bind, that hope is going to bind me to that which God has promised. It's going to connect me to it. It's going to going to uh, uh, yoke me <laughs> to my destiny. Hallelujah. I'm going to press for it despite the circumstance. I'm going to press through it all. I'm going to believe God for it by forgetting that disappointment that told me it would never happen. I'm going to forget it and I'm going to press on to the mark. All right. Because I'm not going to occupy myself with the past. I want to hope even against hope. Because I will stagger not at the promise. I will trust what God said. Now, let's read Psalm 42, verse 11. He's being real here. He's being honest and transparent. Psalm 42, verse 11. Why are you in despair? Oh, my soul. Listen. To him speaking to himself. They called you crazy for talking to yourself. Sometimes you need to talk to yourself. Why are you tripping? Why are you freaking out? Why are you acting like there is no God who is on your side? Why are you acting like the song you just sang last Sunday is not true? So he asks, why are you in despair, O my soul? Another way of of, of using that word despair is sunk down. Why are you sunk down? And why have you become disturbed? I think the King James said disquieted. Why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God. He's telling himself, hope in God. I command you, hope in God. And then the soul said, I can't. Hope in God. Take authority with your will over what your emotions are trying to do. Those are two different parts of your soul and they can be in conflict. Quit being led by your emotions. Use your will and make your emotions surrender. Listen, how do you grow in faith? How do you become strong in faith? We just read it over in Romans. He became strong in faith. Nobody remembers. Giving glory to God. Y'all were like, during the headlights. <laughs> he became strong in faith, giving glory to God. So how then is the psalmist, this was not David, by the way, but how then is the psalmist able to force 
his emotions in line. How was he able to forth faith and hope? He told his soul to hope in God. But how was he able to make that happen? Because it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to live it. So he's talking to himself. We're being practical. We want to use real tools that will help us actually make this happen. You can talk to yourself all day. It's not going to change anything unless you activate it by the, pr- the premise of Scripture. He grew in faith by giving glory to God. Now watch this. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Why have you become disquieted or disturbed within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. How are you going to stir hope? By giving God praise. How are you going to strengthen faith? By giving God glory. Praise is going to position you to hope for tomorrow. Praise is going to position you to believe God against everything that's speaking contrary. Hoping against hope. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Hopest thou, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. Now notice this. He's telling his soul to hope in God. Why? Because his soul is disquieted. His soul is disturbed. That means he's not feeling it. He's not feeling it. He just told us his soul was a wreck. His emotions were a wreck. And yet, shall I praise him? You you can't wait until you feel it to praise God. Baby, use your will. I know he's my help. I know he's my God. And I choose to bless him, not because of what I feel, but in spite of how I feel. I want to spite my feelings and bless him anyway. I shall yet praise him by choice. Not because I felt a quickening, not because the song was nice. I'm choosing to praise him despite how distraught I am. Because I know on the other side of a magnificent praise is greater hope. Is greater faith. It won't solve it all in one hallelujah. But each hallelujah gets me closer and closer to where I need to be. So we got to get to this place where we stop getting led astray by what we feel. Nobody is telling you what the old song, nobody told me the road would be easy. Right? Nobody told you you were going to feel good the whole way out. What he said was, you're going to make it. But we let our emotions cause us to hit the brakes. And in some cases, to turn the whole car around and go back where we came. Don't do it. You are going to hurt. You are going to be disappointed. You are going to be frustrated. But you have to believe God. But how do I do it? It's so hard. It is hard. But your will is more powerful than your emotions if you just tap into it and say, I will yet praise him. Now, either you emotions can come on with me or I'm going to assault you with my praise. Because when I praise him, the walls that are built up around my heart are going to come tumbling down. <laughs> oh, man. If I was T.D. Jake, I'd be running around the church right now. Just, just running. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> this is how we do it. This is how we have hope for what's to come. God has good thoughts about you all. He has good thoughts about you. There is good stuff on the horizon. But it's not going to happen just because the good guy on the throne thought it. He didn't say he spoke it. He said he thought it. Honey, whatever he speaks happens. He didn't say what he thinks. 
if that's sacrilege, no, it's real. You think that he was thinking about people dying, children getting hit by cars, people getting murdered. He said that, 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 that's just what God sits in on, on the throne thinking about because he's that kind of sadist. That's what we make God out to be when we make these statements like, oh, it was the will of the Lord. No, I wasn't. Shut up. Everything that happens is not the will of the Lord. All right? So just because he thought it doesn't mean it's going to happen. So how do I get what he has in mind for me to actually manifest in my life? I connect to it. I bind to it with hope, with expectancy. And I praise him in my press. I praise him for what's coming. Because even if I haven't seen it, even if I can't conceptualize it, I trust him enough to know it's good. So I challenge you all, leave this place with hope stirred, with hope kindled. Put a smile on your face. But I don't feel it, Pastor. That's because you haven't praised enough. Because if you praised enough, the spirit of heaviness would have lifted. Yes. Yes. Cool. The government prays for the spirit of heaviness. So we got to do this. This can't just be information. This is not information Sunday. This is change your life Sunday. This is walk into your destiny Sunday. This is finally see those prayers come to pass Sunday. This is how we do it. So the ball, my dear friends, is in your court. God has done his part. He thought the good things for you. Now it's time for you to pull them out of his mind.